Hello, sort of the self to one with Tactics Podcast. Today it's going to be about hypnosis, probably, just because I'm having a clip by the Tim Ferriss Show or from the Tim Ferriss Show here on my main YouTube page, my home YouTube page or whatever you want to call it. And so I think since um, hypnosis is a topic that is important for me, was important for me, and I think is rather interesting and can be tremendously useful for some people out there, um, let's see. Let's talk about that. Let's see what we can find today. Let's fire that up in a really small second. So what is hypnosis? Doctor, what is hypnosis? <laughs> Dr. Andrew Huberman explains, and it is from the Tim Ferriss Show, as I stated before. Um, this video was uploaded on October 29th, 2021. So... It's not the newest one, it's not the oldest one, but I think it is okay. It is fine. Let's have a look. Let's just have a look. I would say, why is there no sound? And the wrong one. There we go. I'd like to come back to hypnosis for a second. I've never been hypnotized, nor well, maybe I have self-hypnotized and just not realized that's what I was doing. What characterizes hypnosis or how would we define that? And do the states induced by hypnosis have any shared characteristics with some of the states induced by any psychedelics? So hypnosis is a state of calm and high focus. So context is restricted. It's like looking at something through a telephoto lens. You're eliminating the surround. So it's a state of high focus, which normally as we talked about earlier with the aperture, the visual system would be associated with a high degree of excitement or stress. But hypnosis... Something that we've been talking about yesterday, um, stress, okay, what is stress? Not necessarily dealing with stress, unfortunately, but this would be uh, the second part of this video that I was going through yesterday. But still really interesting to see the correlation between the visual system and stress. Um, dilated pupils, meaning higher focus, meaning... Um, more stress, basically. A unique state because you have a high degree of focus, but you're very relaxed. And just to remind people that neuroplasticity is triggered by states of high focus, followed by periods of relaxation later in deep sleep or in non-sleep deep rest. In hypnosis, it brings both those states together at the same time. And this is one of the reasons it's effective in accelerating neuroplasticity. I could probably do it right now to see if how hypnotizable you are. There's actually a test, a clinical test called the Spiegel eye roll test. Spiegel's father was a hypnotist and a psychiatrist. So these, I want to be clear, these are not stage hypnotists. These are board certified MDs and PhDs who there's a lot of scientific research to support what we're about to talk about. So typically when we get sleepy, when we're relaxed, our eyelids close and our eyes go down and the chin goes down. The induction to hypnosis involves doing the opposite, looking up, which actually, believe it or not, creates a state of alertness, and then having you close your eyes. So it creates a, a kind of conflict in the cranial nerves that innervate the eye and eyelid muscles. Again, the eyes and your state of mind are so intricately wired back there in the brainstem. So if you could look up toward the ceiling, Tim, with your eyes open, and then just while still maintaining upward gaze, if you could just slowly close your eyelids. Oh boy, you're really hypnotizable. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so what did you see? That was uh, yeah, deeply so, uncomfortable. Uh, this is also the test that um, Spiegel, David Spiegel, is it David? I think it is David Spiegel. Uh, in the last episode where we have watched a video where Andrew Huberman was being hypnotized by David Spiegel, um, he also did that. And he pointed out, as far as I remember, and I hope that I'm not talking shit there, that when your eyes goes up and you are, how do you fucking say this? I know what it is in German, but <laughs> not in English. So when you look up and you uh, and you you uh, close the distance between your pupils, quite you know, so your two pupils, and you kind of look to your nose, if you know what I mean. Uh, apparently, this is also an indicator for uh, being. Uh, very well hypnotizable or some shit. Yeah. 
uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's a little bit odd. So, so for those of you listening or watching, you, you sort of look up towards what, you know, sometimes in yoga communities they, or meditation communities, they call the third eye center. You know, we don't actually have a third eye, but if we did, it would probably be someone decided it would be between our two eyes and our forehead. So by looking up, you're inducing alertness. And then you're creating this conflict where we're, I asked you to close your eyelids, which is what you do when you're in a state of sleepiness. And what Spiegel, both Spiegel Sr. and Spiegel Jr. have figured out is that it's a very good predictor of how hypnotizable people are. You can look up the Spiegel eye roll test. And what I was looking for is, let's say if somebody is not very hypnotizable, what will happen is as they close their eyes, they'll have a hard time closing them slowly. They'll just kind of snap shut and their eyes will roll forward. In other words, I'll see their pupils again. What happened when I saw you do this is that your eyelids were closing very slowly and I saw the whites of your eyes. Your eyes were starting to roll back into your head. So you would have a score of probably about a four, which is very hypnotizable. I'm about a four. Some people you'll just notice you say, look up and then slowly close your eyes and their eyes will just kind of snap shut and their eyes will roll forward right before it snaps shut. (laughs) So you can do this experiment of sorts on people that you know, and it predicts pretty well how quickly or easily you, you will go into hypnosis. I should mention that no one will go into hypnosis if they don't want to, but if you're interested in exploring hypnosis with the Reverie app or with a clinical hypnotist and your eyes roll back the way that yours did, Tim, then um, you're home free. You're, you're going to be long amazing. and gone before this. Oh, amazing. I could, uh, maybe I'll start speaking in tongues too. It does have a good, uh, good associated look with it. How would you explain the utility of hypnosis? And, and then I yeah. do want to hear if there are any sort of correlates to some of the known effects of psychedelics. And that's a wide spectrum of class. So we could choose, we could choose sure. a, a given compound. Uh, but what, yeah. what are the, what are the clinical applications? Because in my hypnosis naive mind, I think smoking cessation, isn't it good for quitting smoking? Isn't it good for really just these anecdotal reports that I've read at one point or another, but what's the sort of clinical, what are some of the clinical applications? I would believe that it is good for everything related to the subconscious mind. With kind of the knowledge that I have, might also be about childhood trauma. And actually, since there is self-hypnosis and the Reverie app um, by David Spiegel, by the way, only, <laughs> and I've said this so many times, only available for iOS at this point of time. Uh, apparently, they are working on the Android app that I am really looking forward to. But still, um, apparently, these are certain scripts. I'm not able to look into it since not having an iPhone. Um, but it is self-hypnosis, and one might be able to really work on on certain subconscious uh, patterns that uh, are really not serving one, whether it is, you know, negativity, whether it is, um, I don't know. I mean, there are so many things that are going on in our subconscious mind, in our mind in general. And so I think it is probably a pretty great tool to work on them sort of practical applications of hypnosis. Yeah, so for smoking cessation, if people do the practice, about a 60 to 80% success rate, depending on the study you look at. These were all blinded controlled studies. In terms of anxiety relief, those are tremendously strong effects. As many as 90% of people are going to feel significant improvement in anxiety for pain management, for chronic pain. There's a high degree of success. So, you know, people will vary depending on how hypnotizable they are and how regular they are about the practice. But I would say when it comes to pain, and this apparently is also the case for cannabis, as um, stated also by Andrew Huberman in a very recent episode by the Huberman Lab podcast around cannabis um, effects and, you know, what it does and, and whatever, apparently it is partly because you are or one is distracting oneself from the pain and is just not feeling it because of that. Um, I think though that there is, as far as I remember at least, there is uh, components of of relieving pain. So indeed like, you know, painkiller-ish, but most of it apparently is um, not recognizing the pain anymore and just being distracted, which might actually be the case for meditation uh, or hypnosis as well. Um, even though it's not a state, you know, that you're in for quite some time. But maybe it's also something like developing in yourself, like an ability to see things and unsee those same things or different ones. But 
um, the, the episode on cannabis is is quite interesting, by the way. Something being said was people that do consume cannabis, um, of course, I mean, there is this, this is it a stigma? Is it is it a fact? Maybe there's something in between that um, when you're smoking and uh, probably depends on, on the strain, on uh, the type of cannabis, that you're getting more creative, that, um, I mean, probably there are certain reasons why um, a lot of musicians and, you know, people in a creative industry probably do smoke a lot. And um, he was also talking about creativity, which was really interesting and which opened my eyes to why maybe so many people in the creative space are so fucking caffeine addicted, because apparently uh, creativity does have something to do with dopamine and caffeine does, I think, increase dopamine receptors and or their ability to um, attach dopamine, either one of those or maybe even both and this long term, which you know, might lead to maybe uh, caffeine also does help with creativity. But, you know, it's just a thought I had. Anyway, um, apparently people that do smoke are also more creative when they're not in, uh, when they're not high, basically, which was quite interesting. So it's, it's not only that you are more creative when you're high, but apparently also when you're not high. Just but anywhere from a 50 to 75% of people will experience a significant reduction in chronic pain. And if they are using pain meds, they tend to be able to take lower doses of pain medications in order to manage that pain. So it's, it's quite powerful. Now for trauma and things of that sort, it, it needs to be done with a clinical, uh, I would hope board certified MD clinical hypnotist. And there the success rates are, are quite high as well. And if you want more research about this, inside the Reverie app, there's a long list of resources. You could also, I can send over a, a good review article that David's written. In These are, again, published in very fine quality peer review journals of the New England Journal, JAMA, SORT, and things like that. Great. In terms of similarity to psychedelics, they are quite distinct, actually. So hypnosis being a state of high degree of focus and relaxation is a bit similar to some of the so-called psychedelic. So MDMA assisted psychotherapy, which it appears thanks to the support and work of people like you and the MAPS group and the group at Hopkins in particular, Matthew Johnson. And I realize there are other people in that mix, but it's, it, I have to just say as a, as a point, it's, it's really exciting to see what's happening and the enthusiasm about safe building safe protocols that people can access after so many years of people having to do this kind of renegade or in unregulated environments. MDMA creates in a very atypical state. It's a state of high dopamine release. Now, typically dopamine is associated with a focus on things external to us. Dopamine being a a molecule associated with motivation and reward makes us want to do more of things that brought the dopamine, (laughs) whether or not that's food, sex, uh, online viewing of any kind, et cetera. It's not always always bad. But that online um, viewing... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> online viewing, whatever that is. I, the best way to describe the effects of dopamine are that there's a book actually, quite good book called The Molecule of More. And that's a great way to describe it. I wish I had written that book. I read the book and thought, I wish I'd written this book. It's because I, I love the neuromodulator systems and it is the molecule of more. And actually anyone that thinks that dopamine is about pleasure, not motivation or seeking more, consider this. This is a, an anecdote I borrowed from my colleague, Anna Lemke, who's in the Department of Psychiatry at Stanford. The next time you eat a piece of chocolate or you engage in a behavior that feels particularly delicious, notice the sensation and the thoughts in your mind. It's rarely about complete presence and desire for staying present. It's usually a desire for more. It's this, I want more of this, please, as opposed to really basking in the experience. And I should mention that Anna has a wonderful book coming out in August called Dopamine Nation. She was in The Social Dilemma. She's an addiction therapist and psychiatrist and talks a lot about the dopamine system. So dopamine makes us want more of whatever feels really good. And that tends to place us in an external focus. Serotonin, another feel-good molecule, is the exact opposite. It tends to make us feel good with what we already have. It tends to be the incredible feelings of, of warmth that, you know, holding a child or a loved one or time with your dog. 
There are also great episodes by Andrew Women and once again the Andrew Women Lab podcast around serotonin and dopamine and you know naturally increasing it and you know what it is, what it does, and so on and so forth. Definitely also worth checking out if you are maybe seeing like uh, a problem that that you're having in particular with either dopamine or serotonin. So I'm um, always wanting more and or maybe both not really being contempt or uh, happy with what you're already having. So might be maybe useful to check that out and uh, have a look at it. Dog. I have this bulldog Costello and there's times when I just sit with him and I feel immense pleasure just being there. I don't think I want four bulldogs. In fact, I definitely don't want four bulldogs. The snoring is loud enough already. But it's about experiencing the here and now in a full and complete way. MDMA is unique because it creates huge increases in dopamine and serotonin at the same time. And we don't ordinarily see that in natural experience. And it has this unique property of making people feel very excited and positive about their relationship to their internal state. And so it has a kind of looping back of a mechanism that normally would place us in the viewing of the exterior. What's out there? What can I get more of? Who can I interact with more of? What drug can I take more of that's going to make me feel this way? So MDMA is very unique. And I mention it because it has certain correlates with hypnosis in that it's a very focused state. In fact, so much so that let's just say I could imagine that if you're hearing music and you focus on that music, you can really kind of start to merge with the music. Whereas if you focus on your internal state, you can merge with your internal state. And that's why I do think it's important that some of that, if people are doing it in a clinical setting, be guided because otherwise the experience can be sort of lost on whatever is external. Other psychedelics of the sort like psilocybin, LSD, they have a very sleep-like state. They tend to be more serotonergic in nature and they are very similar to sleep in the sense that space and time become very fluid. Whatever top-down governing mechanisms exist in the brain, so-called you know, executive function, some of that seems to be dysregulated enough so that inside of those psychedelic states and in, certainly inside of dreams, anything can really happen and you can essentially see and appreciate novel associations that normally wouldn't occur in waking states. We should remember that the two extremes of human experience are stress and or excitement. So highly contracted visual window, highly contracted time domain, everything sliced very finely. What's happening next? What's going to happen next? Think you're in the line at the airport and the person in front of you is moving slowly and you got a plane to catch. Everything constricted to right there, both in space and time. And then sleep, where in sleep, space and time are extremely fluid. Anything can happen and you are essentially out of control mentally. It's just whatever is going to happen is going to happen. Psychedelics are very much like that, except that in LSD. I'm just thinking about boredom. Whenever, at least when I'm bored, I feel like that, you know, time is moving very, very slowly. And um, time perception and how we're perceiving time is such an, an interesting topic, I'd say. Um, and I was thinking about what what Andrew also said, which is, it might be that stress is that when my inner metronome does not match with my outer metronome. So um, maybe when I'm bored, my inner metronome, so my inner clock is ticking way faster than the outside um, because I'm bored. And this might be the reason which, you know, this being like, maybe, I don't know, uh, this being a stress, uh, a stress situation or a stress response inside of, of my body or from my body and this basically is uh, making my time perception being so slow might be the case i don't know i would have to look that up again um but yeah just spotlights the in psilocybin assisted states you're alert so i would say that psilocybin and lsd like states are similar to hypnosis in that way but hypnosis has a little bit more of a rigidity to it. It's set toward a particular focus, like let's work on your control over stress or smoking or pain. And so I would say the three of them occupy neighboring spaces, but none of them overlap completely. And there we go. Maybe you're always interested in how to peel hard-boiled eggs without peeling, which is the first video there. And... 
the bottom one, Remember Death and Don't Let Time Just Go By by Rolf Potts. Um, a short or a clip from the Tim Ferriss show that I have had a look at and I think it is quite interesting. It was about Memento Mori, um, which is You're Gonna Die, I think, or something. Might be the case. I don't know. But yeah, I do really dearly hope that I've been able to share certain things of value with you and to you and that I've been able to shine some light onto certain ideas. And I'm hopefully going to see you the next time. So bye-bye. I always have to wait a bit. I know that. I'm not cutting off the end, which which happens quite sometimes.